68th episode of the Flipped Learning Network podcast. I'm your host, Troy Cockrum. Did I start too soon? I think I did. <laughs> I think it wasn't saying live when you said your first line. You might okay, want to repeat. Okay, I'll start over again. Welcome to the 68th episode of the Flipped Learning Network podcast. I'm your host, Troy Cockrum. Joining me today again is Joan Brown. Hi. Um, and today we're going to take a, a slightly different approach approach to the podcast. Um, there's no interview today. Um, Joan and I were talking about different um, ideas in education and I've always been perplexed or bothered by the by students lack of search skills um, and the fact that the, uh, the Google makes things too easy that they could be much more efficient with how they search things but they don't realize it um, and also I think a lot of teachers aren't very good at searching as well and this is probably why the students don't learn how to search properly um, and Joan had a great resource um, on the Google EDU site um, Google on Education that has a lot of great resources that could be used in a flipped classroom. So we so, decided that's what we would talk about today. Troy, and you're absolutely right as far as search goes. I am working with teachers on a regular basis and I offer my services to find them things. And for me it's, it's a very easy job, you know, to find things. Um, because of just a few search strategies that you and I probably know really well and they're unfamiliar with. Um, and I know we were just talking about limiting it by time frame for that matter. Um, but I thought I wanted to highlight um, some of the things there at uh, Google EDU site that I was happy to find in the last week and looking at it from a flipped uh, learning perspective there's a few things that teachers might find are innovative and they might want to give it a whirl. So first thing we were talking about was how to get there. I think I'll do a screen share if that's okay. Yep. And how to get to um, the actual site that is google.com forward slash edu. So if you put that in your URL you're going to come to this page and you'll see a lot of links at the top. They've got a good menu here. But what I'd like most of us to do is to scroll down a little bit and you'll also see, oh, not on this page, you're going to see um, a few more things on each of these pages. So I actually went into the tools and solutions section. What do you think about all these new banners, <laughs> Troy? Um, they look nice. I the one thing I don't like is that the buttons that we need are now below the fold, um, which is a newspaper I, term. But um, I, I would like the buttons to be a little bit higher so that you can see them on your initial page. I don't like to scroll down. So I got to ask: are are folks that are using tablets? I think it's geared to them, but. I, you're right. I'm having to scroll just a hair down to get to the content I want to see, which is odd. I, I really have never found that before on websites. So it's either my resolution is bad or <laughs> this is a, a new way to, to produce content. But where I was taking everybody, sorry I digress, um, <laughs> below the banner there are six circles there and the one I would like uh, to emphasize is the one called Search and Discovery. And once you click that, you do have to scroll down. And I went past a lot of these because I was familiar with the art project. I'm familiar with the Cultural Institute. I'm familiar with YouTube. Um, but I scrolled way down near the bottom and I found Search Engine for K-12 Education. And um, I need to do a little bit of, of background information about this. Um, there has always been a discussion about the difference between uh, the internet for say uh, education and the internet for uh, commercial ventures 
And so if you think about it, we wanted it to branch off. I mean, when, when the internet first came out, it was university-based. But mm -hmm. because all of the dot-coms came in and all, it's been much harder for us to find education or scholarly material in one place. Like Google did a really nice job with Google Scholar, um, but that's not a K-12 through option. And I think this particular search engine may answer that question because they're using what is called LRMI. And I'm going to do my best to try to explain what that is. But basically, LRMI is a metadata coding system that they're trying to standardize for education so that when you build content, you basically tag it in a particular way. And it stands so for uh, Learning Resource Metadata Initiative. Exactly. So now I'm going to go back to sharing my screen, if I can do so. And I'm going to kind of show you this, uh, this custom search that it does, it does look good. I mean, it, it looks like it's, it's something that I, if, if I were still in the regular classroom, I'd be using, I will be using it all the time now when teachers ask me to help them with uh, searching for something. So if I want to search for uh, Tammany Hall, did I spell that right? That's a typical uh, topic we need to teach in uh, seventh grade history. And here's what's great. I get only education-related content. You'll see it's from scholastic.com, and I'm getting stuff from, uh, I see history matters, history.com. I don't have any of the dot-coms in here, Britannica's in here, and so forth. Now, at the top, I can get a little more specific. Here are the LRMI sites, those that have actually followed the standard of what to put in the code, if you will, on the website. I love this, games. I can actually sort by educational games. Here are the videos that are out there that sort of cover the topic, and they're not just YouTube anymore. Um, they're all over the place. In fact, uh, I was looking at one where it showed uh, Annandale, is that what it's called? Um, Vimeo's in here. And then, of course, here are the lesson plans. Um, amazing. I can just find a whole list of lesson plans right here without getting mixed in. Open education resources are Creative Commons um, available to everybody, uh, you know, copyright friendly kind of uh, uh, topics. Mm -hmm. Finally, of course, we got images. <laughs> um, all of these uh, under Open Education, I believe, are going to be your Creative Commons images that you can use freely. Um, so, you know, for a teacher perspective, this is a gold mine. Absolutely. But let's look at it from, say, a student perspective. And uh, let's go acids and bases. And um, if I'm a kid and my teacher said, you know, uh, they taught us today, but I, I really am not clear, I can go in here and find videos that I know are going to be right on the money as far as teaching me rather than entertaining me. Uh, <laughs> hate to say that, but I did. Um, I might even find some other teacher's lesson plan in here that might be a little clearer, their PowerPoint or a slideshow of some kind that might help me. So it's a resource for both, wouldn't you guess, as far yeah. as that goes? I, and um, I won't mention the name of the company, but uh, our, our district just subscribe to a service and, and um, it, it, it was a way to come up with lessons that were that were common that were you could search by common core um, common core standard and find lessons that matched that common core standard and I looked at it and I thought well I, I mean some of the some of the lessons were good some of them we're all right, but some other teachers started doing the search as well, and a lot of them were dead links and things like that. And once I started, I would do a Google search compared to the search, and it was better information on Google than there was in this service that we were paying for to call lesson plans for us. And um, so I was a little disappointed. And um, this just makes even more sense for how to be efficient in finding that information. Right. 
I, I just find it as another great resource for teachers, but it would probably be the first place to start. And then if you want to go off the beaten path, you go into Google and you try to find something else. But um, as far as I'm concerned, I did do an interesting search, Troy, that was actually very effective. I was looking up certain tools such as Maps Engine Lite, for example, and I was thinking, huh, I'll put the tool in and I'm going to click lesson plans and sure enough I got some good stuff. So there's another way to use the search engine if you're trying to integrate technology in some way and you're like, hey, I don't really know how to use this, here you go. That's mm -hmm. a way to, to do the search. What I wanted to show, um, and I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Mm. We're going to have to highlight how to use Google Hangouts in the classroom at one point. <laughs> and, uh, uh, okay, so back in the same stuff, teachers were one thing I was to serve education because I get a lot of uh, my school K to eight, and I'll get the third fourth grade teacher will say. Troy, I'm uh, having trouble. Um, let's see. I'm not sure I can hear you. Let's see if we can try that again. Okay. Can you hear and see me now? See the screen share? I'm, you're chopping up. I don't know how to explain it any other way, but your voice is uh, not quite what you want. <laughs> so are you trying to show... Okay, I just turned off the screen share. Maybe it's the screen Am I share. Am I fine now? Yes, I think maybe your band... Apparently it was the screen share. Okay. Well, then, uh, can you screen share again, and I'll talk you through it. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Were you on the search and discovery option in Google Edu? I the, thought I saw that. The, yeah, the search and discovery, and then go okay. down to search education. It's on the left side. Okay. So I'm going to screen share, and then we'll get there. We can do this. <laughs> if my screen will let me. <laughs> there it goes. Uh, we're just having a little... Connections. There we go. Can you see it? Yeah. So okay. then right there on the left. Search, search. education. Uh-huh. Go ahead and visit the site. Um, and then scroll down. And, and like I said, I get a lot of other teachers that will ask, well, how can I teach search? Or, or where can I find this? Because I can tell them all these different ways to, to search more efficiently, but Remembering all of them and teaching them to their students is difficult. And this site has lesson plans and activities. So go ahead and click Browse Lesson Plans. Under the Power Searching or no, under the, the Lesson Plans? Under Lesson Plans. Okay. And if you scroll down, you'll see they have different lesson plans for different levels of searchers on how to do different um, search techniques um, and, they, and they give you full lesson plans on how to do that and different ways to do that. Oh, this one's good right here. Applying filtering tools and basic operators to narrow search results. That one, um, ages ago, I used to do a lesson with the word peanuts. <laughs> And I would require them to search for Peanuts the comic strip and Peanuts the nut. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun with that because you could use the pluses and the quotes and do all kinds right. of fun stuff. Um, and I think if you keep scrolling down, I don't remember if it was this page or if it was a different page that I saw it. Mm -hmm. um, no, it wasn't. Okay, go back one page. All right. And click on the uh, Google Day challenges, the browse challenges. Right. Um, and um, what we were talking about before we actually went on air, this is great because these give you a host of Google Day challenges, but then also give you a slideshow presentation on how to do the search. So, so that you don't have to figure it out on your own you can use their slideshow and teach your students how to how the the most efficient way to answer this particular question. 
I want to kind of back up if, if people are not familiar with a Google a day because um, it's kind of a game. Uh, maybe I should pull that up on, on a website here. Um, if you just, if you just uh, type in a Google a day, you're going to get to the site in which they give you a challenge every day. It's something you need to search for today. It's a history challenge, um, and it's tough, usually. Uh, it starts timing you right away, as you'll probably can see down there. My, my yeah. timer is going, and you're supposed to go out there, search Google as fast as you can to get this answer, and press submit. And, and the longer it takes you, the fewer points you get. And you can make this your daily event and right. just have a blast with it. But as far as students go, a lot of these questions are very challenging because the level of the search techniques you have to use is fairly high. Right. So these lesson plans bring it down into chunks. And, you know, if I were uh, flipping a classroom, um, these would be fantastic because you could work your way through a set of these lessons and give them a whole bunch of skills that they could work with. And then you can provide them a challenge of your own on a regular basis and allow them to do that in the evenings and come back with what they found. So do you want to talk a little bit about how this is divided into different subjects? Yeah, I mean, I like that you can divide it out by culture, geography, history, and science. I can really see history teachers using this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, social studies using the geography, um, but the you know history teacher could really um, bring out ways to do searches, not just George Washington was born on what day, but more significant questions and actually find a lot of uh, in-depth resources and some uh, probably some primary sources um, for the information. Yep. I, I am impressed with succinct. The lesson is not something that's going to take you 20 minutes in class. It'll probably take 5 to 10 and it gives you um, you know, a way that a student might think before they were even putting in search terms, which is part of what um, Google emphasizes. One of the things that it, you might see in some of their, uh, just for the, the regular public, um, search techniques is imagine what the page looks like or what it might say that contains the answer you're looking for. And if you can visualize that, it helps you put in the keyword searches. So a similar concept here, things to think about as you get started. What is the country? How do you search for transportation? <laughs> you know, I like, I like that. It's, it's not telling them exactly what to do, but it is giving them thought involved right. uh, process. And, and, and go back to one of the questions if you could. Okay, sure. Let's see. So... Because these questions are not... Um... <laughs> They're hard, some of them. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I used to play around with Google a day, and I would get frustrated because I couldn't find things, and I'd be like, no, <laughs> I'm supposed to be pretty good at this. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I can see that one under Jeffrey, it says, what colors are the flags in Lupa on July 2nd and August 16th? If, if the kids had that question, uh, I can guarantee 95 to 100% of them would just search that exact question. Oh, you're yes. probably not going to find that answer. <laughs> and so they're asking them, well, first of all, what is LUPA? And, you know, a lot of students probably would not jump to that's a country or a city. You know, they don't think of geography right away. Right. Um, and what is significant about July 2nd and August 16th? That's great. So then it kind of brings them into um, search, what you should search for. It puts it in, in the brackets. Um, and then it tells you what you probably will find when you search there, and then it shows you the search again. Because a Google a day requires multiple searching. Right. It does. It's not something you can put in one search term and find the answer. You've got to go deep into like two or three searches to find everything. 
And so it says the answer as well. So the teacher teacher wouldn't want to put this slide up until <laughs> until after they were finished. Yeah. yeah, but they might want to give them some some thought strategies. So that's that's all um, part of Google a day, and and it's it's one of those things that we we think of. Yeah, I should do that, and then people don't do it. You know. And they really should. They should try like maybe every Friday. You know, let's right. do Google a day. Well, and one of the things that I know I'm always worried about is how am I going to find the answer? Yeah. <laughs> and and that 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 resource helps you pick questions that you can, you know, they already give you how to find the answer. Mm -hmm. um, because that's you don't want to get up there and just search randomly. Or search by trial and error and show them how how not to do it. Uh, You're probably wondering where I just disappeared to. My battery's getting low, so uh, I'm okay. gonna go grab my adapter. I apologize for that. Uh, but it won't take me but a minute. <laughs> I was just worried I'd go off air. You know, that's kind of embarrassing. Uh, all right. Well, we had a um, another one that we wanted to kind of talk about, didn't we? Well, you mentioned the one uh, that you were well, the the Ingram viewer you liked, but you also mentioned the game that your son was playing. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about Ingram viewer, and I hope that's really how you pronounce it, because um, once again, you know, you discover these things, and then someone will pronounce it a different way. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ngram Viewer is kind of more of that data that Google can glean from what they have already online. And uh, I was going to play around with it. It's really a graphing tool uh, to begin with because it's taking what's already in Google Books and it's graphing word frequency throughout time. So we were playing around with this, weren't we? <laughs> And every time I, I play with it, I start thinking, ooh, that's really good. So let me go play around some more, and let's see what we can glean from their, uh, let's see, got to go find it. That's, that's my next thing. All right. I had it up. Oh, yeah. I can go back. So I'm going to go back to google.com slash edu and once again I'm going to go into the tools and solutions and it was down there um, underneath search and discovery and I, I had never seen it and then when I read what it was it says you enter a phrase or a word in the graph and it shows you the frequency. So I went into visit site and they already have Frankenstein, Albert Einstein, and Sherlock Holmes uh, graphed on here so you can get some concept of what it's doing and it's showing you the percentage of times that those words show up and on the uh, x-axis are the years. Now it does stop at the year 2000. I tried and up at the top here I can go all the way up to 2008 but I couldn't get it to go past that. So frequently uh, looked up words for things that are recent is going to be a little troublesome. So like one of my first searches was internet and funny um, it it did graph it but you know kind of goes off the page at the year 2000 right. so that wasn't as helpful to me. Um, one of the ones that I found interesting was was uh, social media. I graphed that and shockingly how often it was in some book somewhere way before the internet <laughs> 1940s 1920s right. and if I want to see where they're pulling that uh, phrase or word from I can scroll down at the bottom and they do have a time span there so let's look at between 1955 and 1963 what books might have contained the terminology social media well, the first one that comes up is the business of government, and hmm, it tells you the page. Right. Um, you just kind of look through a few things. Here's one, um, Africa, the Journal of International African Institute. You know, it's just amazing where these things show up. Um, now, 
were you thinking of a use for this, like in, in English class, perhaps? Well, off the top of my head, I can see more use in a history class, mm -hmm. seeing, a, seeing different trends and maybe searching by a president or a, mm -hmm. or a, or a, a government party. You know, a political party. Um, you know, well, I, I just put in the term Nazi. Um, and look at that. That term was not in any book prior <laughs> to uh, 1927. And it starts showing up 1928, 29. What a right. great conversation just with this graph right before you start learning about World War II. Right. Um, that would be just a great introductory lesson without even having to do a whole lot here. Having the kids pull it up and go, huh, well, what were they talking about? And, they, and pull in maybe some of the literature that it came out of and saying, well, why were they using that term way back in, in time? What were they talking about? Um, and, and I was pulling some of these. Uh, the Nazi International. I didn't know there was such a book, you know. So... Um, Great ways to just introduce words. How about the entomology of words? Yeah, that's um, what I was thinking too as far as um, in English you could say oh, maybe overused words or maybe <laughs> trends in, in what words, how they're used and maybe how they were used yeah. differently in a different time period, things like that. Um, sure. And, and it would be interesting. Um, I was looking at the word cyber. I, I my for just some reason. And I couldn't figure out what the big bleeps were in 1980. That's that's an interesting concept as well. So we looked up Google, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we did. And we found that it was around several times uh, in some odd places. <laughs> it, it's even more, used more in the 1940s, or actually that's about 1950s, than it's mm -hmm. used in 2000. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, you know... Interesting to pull that. Look at this Google destructive scanning work, but that's 1974, so it's not talking about uh, the right people. Um, so I, I'm sure as you as you start playing with this, I, I could see a lot of uses in the classroom. But you'd have to come up with the term, what it would be used for. So one of them I did look up, which uh, was interesting to me from previous uh, history teaching is Native American because we do look at uh, words and how we've used them modern day but isn't it interesting that there are two big, big jumps for Native American in the early 1800s and um, as, a, as a classroom you know you may want to have the students go back and say who was using that term back then rather than the term Indian, or and find out, you know, maybe they were forward thinking, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, what's our last little? Uh, we wanted to talk about my son's favorite. All right, he and I now we're we're kind of um, fans of GeoGuessr, and I bet some of the listeners have tried this. So GeoGuessr is a game that you just play online. And it plops you down somewhere in the world in Street View. And you need to guess where you are in the world. So here I am. I haven't a clue. Oh, oh, I'm going to guess that's some sort of Scandinavian. That looks like the architecture. Mm, um, that. But uh, you can zoom in and try to get a view of, like, signs. Oh, Office of Tourism. Huh? Okay. Yeah, but you never get a really decent, you know, exact. Here, um, they've blurred out license plates, so you cannot see country names. They're very particular about that. But um, you can see what side of the street they're driving on. Uh, we did that. My 10-year-old my figured out Australia because of the side of the street they were oh, driving okay. on. He was very clever. But um, it's a great game. Uh, looky there. What do we have? Is that... Hmm. Veterinary. Spanish, Spanish or French. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And we're by the ocean. Oh, looky there. I can see. So you do a lot of, of cultural uh, evaluation. A tea room. 
Ah. Interesting. And and what I love is because it's street view, you can drive down the road quite a long ways. I was I was having a good time with this driving as far as I could in the middle of nowhere and never seeing a sign. <laughs> <laughs> so then what you do is you come over here and you try to put a little place on the map. Um, and if you're correct, I, I'm going to do a really bad job of guessing this one. I know I am, but I'm going to go with something in Belgium just because I feel like it. So I'm going to pop the, my little marker and say make a guess. Ah, I went too far. Switzerland, eh? Okay. <laughs> that was a good okay. guess. Um, and so you get points based on how close you were uh, to your spot. So now, for teachers, and especially anybody who teaches geography or maybe world languages, we have GeoSetter. And GeoSetter is a way that you can choose the location. Where do you want your students to try and look at and guess? And when you do that, um, you have to do it, uh, I believe, by latitude and longitude. So you will need to be looking up uh, your latitude and longitude and put it in. And um, one of the things I was thinking about as far as a flipped class goes is if I were a foreign language teacher, this could be something you would do on a daily basis. Uh, plop them right there into one of your, uh, you know, whether it be Spanish, French speaking countries and have them guess where, where are we and what were the clues that helped you determine where, why we were there. You know, was it architecture? Was it a sign? Was it the way people were dressed? Uh, you know, was it uh, foliage? <laughs> All those right. are really cool. And I can even see that in literature. I mean, if you've if you've studied sev literature from several different countries for for a class, you could even say, okay, let's use some of the clues from one of the books where you've read to see if we can narrow down what country this is. In. Um, you know, it, it really teaches. Uh, problem-solving skills and and analyzing information that can help us solve the problem. Absolutely. I think that's the whole point of our show today is we, we need to teach the students how to problem-solve, how to right. find things on their own, the information. And um, particularly in a flip class, we're, we're asking kids to be more responsible for their education, that's exactly the next step, is that you need to be more responsible for what you're going to be learning out on your own in the future anyway. So let's start now and get it, get it, those skills right. in there right away. And I mean, this it's amazing the amount of resources that this Google on Education has that, that, I mean, we're both Google certified teachers and I didn't know about a lot of these things. They just appear one day, you know, there's like, um, and there's so many more um, tabs at the top or so many more links at the top. Um, mm -hmm. There's collaboration, there's digital citizenship, there's STEM. Uh, I mean, there's just different things. You could spend days exploring all of these. <laughs> I, I clicked on the STEM section and if you want inquiry-based for your science, your math, or uh, any of your technology classes, go there. Um, a lot of it is based on basic Python programming, but yet there's some that is not. And even, even that that's based on the Python programming is very simplistic, so it's teaching algorithms. But the, the reason it's teaching algorithms is the inquiry piece. It's like, have the kid formulate what are the sequences. And it's unbelievable. I, the lessons there, I, I was just absolutely so eager to read some more. So um, I can't wait to see where that's going to lead. I think these are somewhat hidden. And I think it needs to get out in the public view. Uh, Google really is trying to make all information uh, easily found. Right. But they're trying to do it through teachers, and we got to get the word out to teachers that this is there. <laughs> and uh, for a few, t I mean, this course builder that's under collaboration, um, I I'm, I'm really want to look into that. And so maybe a future episode after I have some ch a chance to play with that, or if there's somebody listening who's used course builder a lot who wants to come on, um, I I see I see a lot of potential in that. Um, as well, you know, and that's hidden down there underneath um, collaboration. 
Um. Yeah, Course Builder acts like you can, uh, it's a learning management system for a small class, but you can also do a massive online course with it, it, it appears. So uh, my understanding is uh, a little, maybe it was last summer, they threw out that Google Maps uh, MOOC and it was done through Course Builder. So that may have been one of the, the first uses of it, I'm not sure. Uh, someone's going to write in and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. But um, now they're offering it for teachers at any level, and that would be fantastic to have that power to be able to build something really big. Right, yeah. right. Okay, well, we'll wrap it up then. Um, you can find these at google.com slash edu um, if you weren't aware of that availability and then just tools and solutions all everything we talked about was under tools and solutions mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of other things there uh, that you can play with um, and I'm sure we're gonna find inf things for future episodes buried in here <laughs> that we can pull out to help teachers so uh, that was um, some great information that you found there Joan well, I, you know, I think it's all about how you Google, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, um, you know, it's great to be on the show again, uh, and hopefully we get to talk a little bit more uh, next week. And we'll we'll, tr we'll try not to. We're not we're not trying to take the place of the Google Educast, um, but Google has so many tools out there. It's hard. It's hard <laughs> not to. Explore hey, they that, haven't so. covered all these. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> and they're all friends of ours, so we yes, know that's that right. uh, that they uh, they do good stuff over there. So, and I will be tweeting out these under Flip News, so that anyone who's listening who can find them again if they want to. That'll be good. Make sure you tweet out that Geo Guesser because that was a that looks like a fun one that could kill hours and hours of time. Uh, yes, it already has <laughs> in my in my life. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for uh, finding time to do this, um, and we will be back again again, hopefully next week. All right, see you, Troy. Okay.